Welcome to video 7 of 8 of the FP3 chapter integration. As usual, a little question on the screen here to get us going. What are these three things and what do they have in common? Pause the video, take a moment to think about it, and when you come back, I will go through. This first one is the trapezium rule from P2. This is when you want to split the area under a curve into many slices, each of which would be a little trapezium with a, an infinitesimal height if you take it into the sum, which is what this one is. But in the trapezium rule, it's not infinitesimal, it's something that you can actually use and you're simply literally going to add all the trapezium areas together. Whereas this one takes that to the limit where the height, which is the delta x, tends to zero you can turn this into a sum, which is that integration from A to B. This is very similar, but for polar curves in FP2, and instead of trapeziums, it is the sector of a circle, which is why we've got a half r squared d theta rather than y dx. So each of these three things are based around the idea of putting together slices to get an area. This one slices you can actually do and these two infinitesimally small slices that you're going to sum in the limit. How does that connect with what we're doing in integration? Well, it connects because in this chapter, we've got two sections on the end of application. So we've done a lot of theory here. We're now going to apply a lot of this work to find the length of an arc of a curve. And in the next video, find the surface area of a shape of revolution. So we're going to be using these ideas and the ideas we just discussed on the previous slide, putting it all together to find these two things. So let's get going. Here we have, as already mentioned in P2 and FP2, area under curve, we can find the length of a curve from here out or from x1 to x2 by considering infinitesimally small sections. But this time we're not going to be using tiny trapeziums underneath or like the polar one, sectors of a circle. We're going to be using tiny chords, which we're going to call delta s. And we're going to do the same as before. Let delta x tend to zero. So these chords are going to get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And we're going to put it to the limit and turn this delta s into a ds. Quick bit of background theory then. The delta s here is the length of the hypotenuse in this little triangle you can see in the diagram. So if you were to do a little bit of Pythagoras, I'm sure you could tell me that delta s squared is equal to delta x squared plus delta y squared. And this very simple piece of Pythagoras is the foundation for the three formulas that follow. So I'll derive one here on the screen and then we'll look at all three on the next slide. So if we take this in red and we divide every term by delta x squared, we get delta s squared over delta x squared. Delta x squared over delta x squared, of course, is one. And delta y squared over delta x squared. Now this, you know, we can write in brackets like this. plus, we want an equals. And of course, I can square root both sides to give delta s over delta x is equal to the square root of 1 plus delta y by delta x squared. Now, that's just a little bit of algebraic manipulation. But now, if we take this to the limit and we allow deltas to become d's in the limit where delta x tends to zero, we end up with ds by dx is equal to the square root of 1 plus dy by dx, which of course you recognize, squared. And if we integrate both sides with respect to x, we end up with the integral of ds is equal to the integral of that square root dx, where this is 1 plus dy by dx squared. 
The right hand side then we can't integrate directly until we know what y is. So we can find dy by dx and square it and do 1 plus that square rooted and then integrate all of that with respect to x. But on the left that's going to give us little s which is the length of our arc. So from x1 to x2 this is the integral of the square root of 1 plus dy by dx squared, integrated with respect to x. So this is our formula, the one that you'll probably use most often to find the length of an arc. All you need to know is the derivative of the function, so you can put that into this formula, and then of course apply all of the integration techniques that we've been using to integrate whatever that comes out as to give you your answer. However, that's not the only formula, because way back here, where we divided by x squared, you didn't actually have to divide by delta x squared. You could have divided by delta y squared, which would have made this term a 1. It still would have been 1 plus, but this would have been delta x squared over delta y squared, and over here, delta s squared by delta y squared. You go through all the same process, and you end up with something very similar, but instead of with respect to x, you'll be integrating with respect to y from y1 to y2 with respect to y and dx by dy all squared. Now we don't use that one very often, it's not all that useful, but there is a third one which is a little more useful than that, is if you divide all of this by delta t squared, where t is going to be for parametric equations, x as a function of t and y as a function of t. And if you follow that through, you end up with dx by dt squared instead of the 1, dy by dt squared instead of dy by dx squared, and ds by dt instead of ds by dx. And you end up with these three formulas coming up on the screen now. So we've got, with respect to x and with respect to y, flipping dy by dx to dx by dy and changing the limits. But more useful than this one over here, which is not all that useful is the parametric version, which is this. And I think you'll find that the with respect to x and with respect to t versions of this formula are both given in the formula booklet. So let's go ahead and do a couple of examples to show how these work. So on the screen we've got to find the exact length of the arc on the parabola with equation y equals a half x squared from the origin to the point p48. <coughs> so I've got my little equation up here in green, which is what we're going to use. We've got y as a function of x, and we've got the coordinate for the origin, 0, and the coordinate for p, 4. So from 0 to 4, 1 plus dy by dx squared and integrate. So let's see what we get. Often examples like this in a textbook or in a tutorial will deal with the derivative and the 1 plus that squared before putting it into the integral. So that's what I'm going to do. So if we just start with y is equal to a half x squared, and of course dy by dx is equal to x. <coughs> now that might seem simple, but of course once I square this and put it inside a square root, I get square root of 1 plus x squared, which suddenly is not so simple to integrate, which is why we're going to need to use our fp3 integration techniques. So my formula becomes s is equal to, from 0 to 4, the square root of 1 plus x squared, integrated with respect to x. Here, if you need to go away and think about this, you can pause the video. I'm going to plough through uh, to solve this. We're going to use, or I'm going to use, a substitution. And the substitution I'm going to use is sinh u. And then dx will equal to cosh u du. <coughs> so when I put that into my integral, from 0 to 4, I get the square root of 1 plus sinh squared u 
times dx, which is cos u du. Now this part here inside the square root 1 plus sin squared u, I hope you remember your identities, that is equal to cos squared u. And then if we square root cos squared, of course we get cos. And then the cos outside here, multiplied by the cos from here, gives us cos squared. So if I apply an identity and simplify it, that becomes cos squared u du. Which by itself is not that easy to integrate either. So I'm going to apply another identity. Cos squared u is equal to a half plus a half cos 2u du. And this I can integrate. So we have u over 2 plus 1 over 4 because of the 2 inside the function here. Sainch 2u. And we don't need a plus c because we've got limits 0 to 4. Now it's important to remember that these limits here are x. This is still x, not u. Now you could put your limits through your substitution here and have limits in terms of u, or you can rearrange sinh 2u back into x's and the u here back into an x and then put the x limits in. And that's what I'm going to do in this example. So if I go back to my substitution, x is equal to sinh u, so u is equal to r sinh x. <coughs> and r sinh x is equal to the log of x plus the square root of 1 plus x squared. Again, I think that is given to you in your formula booklet. So the u in the front here becomes a log x plus the square root of 1 plus x squared. Now, I might leave that as r sinh x if I didn't have numbers to put in, but because we're going to put in numbers, it's going to be a little bit easier to see what this is if I have my x's inside a logarithm rather than inside an r sinh. For the other term, 1 quarter sinh to you, I'm going to use yet another identity. Sinh to you, let me put it up here. Sinh to you is equal to 2 sinh u cos u. And we know sinh u is equal to x from our substitution. And from our work here, if you remember the square root of 1 plus sinh squared, sinh squared u is equal to cos u. So if I want to turn all of this back into x's, that becomes 2 times x from the sinh u times the square root of 1 plus x squared from the cos u. And I've still got a quarter from the integral here. And all of this is in limits from 0 to 4 for x. So now I can put my limits in. If I end up with a 0 on this term here, obviously all of this is 0. And if I put a 0 in here and here, I have a square root of 1, which is 1, and the log of a 1 is also a 0. So the entire second bracket with the limit 0 is all equal to 0. So my final answer is just the first bracket with the 4, end up with half log 4 plus the square root of 1 plus 4 squared is 17. That is all in the logarithm. Plus 2 times 4 over 4 is 2. And the square root of 1 plus 4 squared is again 70. And that, unless I want it in decimal, is my final answer. So there were lots of different stages there. We had to do our derivative and put it inside the formula that we've just looked about for the arc. But when we did that, we then needed to do a substitution in order to integrate that. And we've used quite a number of identities as part of that. And getting from sinh to u back into x's was even a little bit complicated itself. But eventually, if you follow all of that through, 
you would get the answer using the techniques that we've looked at. Of course, the hard part is to problem solve which techniques do I need to solve which problems, because they won't all be like this, obviously. So let's do one more example, this time with the parametric version. So here we've got a curve with parametric equations, x is equal to t plus 1 over t, and y is equal to 2 log t, where t is greater than 0. And over here is a little sketch of that. So we need to find the length of the arc between the points a and b, where they tell us t is equal to 1 and t is equal to 2, respectively. And again, I'm going to do most of this work here inside the square root separately and then put it into the square root once I've simplified what this is. So to start us off, I'm going to need dx by dt. And t differentiates to 1, and 1 over t differentiates to minus t to the minus 2. dy by dt is equal to 2 times the differential of log t, which is 1 over t, so I get 2 over t, or 2t to the minus 1. Now I need to square both of these here and add them together. So squaring dx by dt, I get a 1 minus 2 lots of this, plus this thing squared, so t minus 4. And then I have to add that to dy by dt squared, which gives me 4t minus 2. Now, when you put this into a square root, it doesn't look like it's going to be very nice at all. But bear with me, there's a little trick here. Because when we simplify this, our t to the minus 2 terms come together to give us 1 plus 2t to the minus 2 plus t to the minus 4. And that might not look much better, but if you think about where these three terms came from, squaring this, these three terms have come from squaring something very similar. In fact, it's the same thing, but with a plus instead of a minus, because the only thing from these three terms to these three that has changed is this minus to this plus. And that's very deliberate, because otherwise this question would be undoable with the techniques that we've learned. It would be too complicated. So because I can put this into a bracket like this, and then when I put that inside a square root, of course the square root and the square cancel out, and what I end up integrating is actually very simple. From t1, which is 1, to t2, which is 2, 1 plus t to the minus 2, because the square root from the formula and the square from the bracket here have cancelled out. So compared to the last example, most of the work is knowing this little trick here, because this integral is actually very easy. We've still got limits from 1 to 2. So that's 2 minus 1 over 2, minus 1 minus 1 over 1, which of course is 1, so that's 0. So 2 minus a half is 1.5. And that's our final answer. So a slightly more complicated process to get there, but once we were there, it was much, much easier than the previous example, which was quite easy to get there, but then was a much harder integration to do. And that's it. If you've got your textbook, you can have a go at exercise 4G.